Kato. Um, uh, he mahinu nui kia koutou. Uh, I'm Bridget Robson. I'm the Associate Dean Māori here at the school, and um, it's and it's um, it's my privilege to introduce my colleague, Dr. Kiri Lawson Tiaho, um, for our seminar today. And welcome to all of our um, listeners online. I, I believe there's about sixteen at the moment. Um, so, um, Kerry's going to talk about Māori and Indigenous suicide prevention, global thinking and local action. Uh, she is, um, I'm sure you're going to introduce yourself in terms of your oh. papa, but she has more than 30 years of experience in Māori public health development and policy. She's a very well-respected um, activist and scholar. Uh, she's also been a Fulbright Scholar with the East-West Centre in Hawaii in 1995. And she's completed research placements in Indigenous Public Health at John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins Medical School, Indian Health Services, uh, School of Public Health at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, and the Native American Research and Training Centre at the University of Arizona, Tucson. She, her research interests in the areas of historical trauma, healing and suicide prevention, Indigenous self-determination and tribal development. Kiri is a member of the International World Dignity University Initiative, the Society of American Indian Psychologists, and is a New Zealand representative on the International Task Force of Indigenous Psychologists. Um, Kiri has, has convened two very significant international Indigenous um, suicide prevention symposiums, one just last week with a number of speakers from um, international speakers and uh, local speakers. So it's kia ora Kiri. <laughs> Looking forward to he hearing what you've got to say. Kia ora. Uh, ko te mea tūtahi he mihi nui ki ngā, ngā tangata kua wehe atu ki a whetulangi tia. Haere, haere, haere atu rā. Rātou te hunga mate ki a rātou. Tātou te hunga ora ki a tātou. Ko Kiri Lawson te aho tōku ingoa, no ngai tahu. Ngā tira kehu ngai tāre wa ngā hapo, no ngai tūhoi, ngā te rono te hapo, no ngā te kahunganu ki te wairoa, no ngā te pāhau wera, ngā te rongo mai wāhine, Oku hapu, no ngāti parau, hoki ahau, no Samoa, Tahiti, Denmark ahau. No reira he mihi no anō tēnei ki a koutou, a ki a tātou katoa. Well, kia ora everybody, thank you for tuning in and thank you for coming along um, to hear about the work that many of us have been doing in the international uh, context, indigenous context, and also in the local context in Aotearoa, New Zealand, with regard to Māori and Pacific suicide prevention. As Bridget said, I've been at this a long time, um, 30 years. And like many of us involved in this field of suicide prevention, it comes from a very uh, deep personal place of having experienced suicide in our whānau, in our hapu, in our iwi, in our communities. I tried for a little while to have a break from it, but it keeps finding me. So I figure I'm, this is a lifelong commitment that I need to make and that indeed I have made. Last week we held the inaugural Global Indigenous Suicide Prevention and Mental Health and Wellbeing Research Symposium at Te Papa. We had speakers there from all over the Indigenous world. We also had a number of leaders, researchers, um, community activists and advocates, young activists, radical activists, 
uh, parents and uh, especially mothers who had lost children to suicide. Um, and we also had a group of over 100 Māori and Pacific youth present in another, um, in another meeting called the Youth Development Workshops. So what I want to talk to you about today is the progress that we're making in suicide prevention, Indigenous suicide prevention. The um, recently uh, released Māori suicide prevention strategy um, that I co-authored with uh, Professor Sir Mason Jury, um, Michael Naida, who's a te Arawa, young te Arawa leader, in this suicide prevention, mental health and well-being um, co-papa, and also um, Jordan Jordan Whitey, who had a hand in uh, in writing the strategy. So that was presented to um, government four government ministers last week during the symposium, um, along with a uh, a publication called the Tūramarama Declaration. And the Tūramarama Declaration is an indigenous global declaration about suicide prevention. And those, those Tūramarama ki te ora will be going to the United Nations and also to the World Health Organization at the end of this year. So we're doing everything we possibly can and working very hard in our own ways around the indigenous world. Okay, so the cope-up of today's corridor is about the enduring impacts of colonization, the relationship between colonization and suicide in current generations, um, the validity of historical trauma and the multi-generational effects of colonization transmitted through historical trauma pathways. And we really are above and beyond as Indigenous people, as Indigenous researchers, we are above and beyond any challenge and any contesting of the validity of colonization and the enduring and ongoing effects. And one example is the recent uh, announcement of royal inquiry into the state ward system in this land. We think about the numbers of Māori who are incarcerated who are in child welfare um, systems put into stranger care, dislocated and disconnected from whānau, hapu and iwi. There, are a, there is an enduring uh, fact in all of those outcomes in the current generation. And that fact is that they have their roots in colonisation and systems and power dynamics that were established from the period of first contact and endorsed through the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840. So the contemporary or one of the key challenges that we have as Indigenous peoples is to, I'm a, I'm a psychologist by training, my training was a process of invisibilizing my identity as an indigenous woman. And my understanding is that is still the experience. It's very hard, although we have some excellent practitioners working in bicultural partnerships. And I list, for example, um, Dr. Alistair Bush, working with David Epstein and um, Ko Matua Wiremu Nianea. Um, the work that uh, Dr. Diana Rangihuna, in partnership with now Dr. Diana Korpua, in partnership with the Tairawhiti DHB and Otago University, who employs her, and her husband, Tāmoko specialist Tōhunga, um, 
Mr. Mark Corpua. So we have, since 1974, uh, since Jules Alder wrote the Pākehā Papers, which was a critique of Western psychology and the application of it to Māori, um, Jules Alder was a psychologist and a lecturer based at the University of Otago in Dunedin. And he, um, I don't even know if he's still around, um, but his writing certainly is. So you can get a copy of the Pākehā papers and I recommend that you do that. Um, so there have been a lot of challenges and questions about the application of Western psychology to the reality, the lives, the issues faced by Indigenous peoples. Um, and there's been quite a strong movement that has developed into the International Task Force of Indigenous Psychologists, of which I'm a member. Okay, so James, Professor James Liu and I wrote a paper in 2010, and I've got references in here about, um, there is, I think I've written 14 publications on the subject. Um, plus a PhD. So we found that contemporary Indigenous First Nations psychologists developed an alternative frame for viewing suicide that not only shifts the focus from individual level to group level explanations, but challenges discourses that position group level influences as risk factors that can easily but be subsumed within standard repertoires for suicide prevention. The enduring impacts of colonization are contemporarily expressed in the desire to end one's life. Um, and I have a reference there. The validity of historical trauma and multi-generational effects. Now we know from the work of Maya Henrik et al, who are Jewish scholars, who first uh, started theorizing around the existence of an ongoing multi-generational uh, psychological trauma effect from the process of, from the Holocaust. On strength of their research, and they are recognized leaders in this field, on strength of their research, a group of American Indian or Native American researchers, uh, Maria Braveheart, um, Drs. Eduardo and Bonnie Duran, um, more recently, Professor Karina Walters um, and the Washington School University, Washington State University, um, and others have taken hold of that idea of multi, the multi-generational transfer of trauma and taken it up in terms of indigenous theorizing that explains things like poor mental health outcomes, high suicide rates in indigenous communities. So what does this mean for indigenous suicide prevention? Well, quite simply put, if I put my psychologist hat on, it means that my profession is inherently limited if I'm to ignore and refuse to see the validity of colonization and the trauma effects of colonization when I'm working in the space of suicide prevention. So what draws us together and we are unified in our purpose or our mission or however you want to describe it is the struggle for indigenous self-determination and sovereignty. As promised in the Māori language version of the treaty, and it's a, a little known fact, but I think an increasingly um, known fact that in international law, there exists a thing called the proferentum rule. And the prof contra proferentum rule. And the contra proferentum rule says that where there is a dispute about uh, the interpretation and application of a treaty, the first priority is to uh, recognize, honor, uphold 
the indigenous language version of that treaty. What that means for us in Aotearoa is that the indigenous language version of the Treaty of Waitangi, which promised significantly more than, um, than governorship as, as a member of, of the Aotearoa, of Aotearoa society, promised us the maintenance of our rangatiratanga and all of our taonga and treasures, including our language, our land, our water, so, um, and, and many other resources. The, 40 of, the Treaty of Fort Laramie, which was signed with the Sioux or the Lakota population, um, it's a, a, the same thing that the contra proferentum rule applies in cases of legal disputes or challenges. But we all know that that has not been upheld, that international law provides a set of guidelines only, and we don't currently have a leg to stand on in terms of going back to that rule and saying, hang on a minute, you know, you promise more, you sign, we didn't sign up for this. Okay, so there is a very strong indigenous movement that is resisting the ongoing colonization uh, process. So recently we had Standing Rock, um, Timor East or East Timor, the beast which was um, happened locally and it was a group of young Māori resisting the um, deep sea drilling for oil into Ikaroa and yeah, the waterways, the coast that stretch from the waters that stretch from the east coast all the way to just off Kapiti, I think. <clears throat> the struggle for Tenoranga Teratanga, according to the great, wonderful Dr. Moana Jackson, who's a, a human rights lawyer of note, highly respected, says that sovereignty or tenoranga tiratanga equates to freedom. And freedom means the ability to make choices, life choices, the decision to live, the ability to live on tribal land and practice uh, tribal cultural values, to keep our language alive, um, and many other um, valuable processes. Kia piki te oro te tai tamariki was the Māori suicide, the very first, actually the very first indigenous suicide prevention strategy in the world. And I wrote the strategy in 1993. And kia piki te oro te tai tamariki is still valid, but it was never realised and it was never, um, never endorsed by government. There were many, many arguments about the role of colonisation, um, which back then, what's that, 30 years ago? My math ain't, isn't great. Um, but the idea about the effects of colonisation as driving up Māori suicide, um, as having contemporary effects, as leading to the formation and entrenchment of um, trauma pathways was noted in Kia Piki Te Ora o Te Tai Tamariki. Now that it wasn't um, implemented according, we gave the government 30 years ago, we gave the government advice about suicide prevention that was systematically ignored. So now here we are in 2018 giving them yet more advice saying you cannot ignore the role of colonisation and historical trauma in suicide prevention. Historical trauma um, is really uh, is a direct result of the changes and transformations of the processes of colonisation. Okay, I want to show you a PowerPoint by. Um, Ta Mason Dury.
And I'm just going to um, just allude to this. It's not up on the what? Try that. That. It's on a separate PowerPoint. Yeah, it's on a separate PowerPoint. Yeah, it's on a separate PowerPoint. Minimize this one. And see if you can find the other one. Is it there? It's that one. From beginning. Okay. So this is uh, Tar Mason's presentation from the um, recent Global Indigenous Suicide Prevention Research Symposium, or GISC. So he acknowledges that there is no single reason or explanation for suicide, but there are a number of factors that operate in concert with each other. And so the idea with, or the, the assertion with the impacts of colonization, the production of historical trauma as a result of colonization, and the ongoing contemporary processes of colonization um, produces a whole lot of kind of um, other experiences or what we might call risk factors for suicide. The Tūramarama Declaration is a global indigenous declaration for suicide prevention. Okay, I'm not going to need that. And I'm not. Other than to point out this, um, these are um, explanations for suicide, and I, I point want to point out dispossession and uh, being dispirited or disheartened um, as influencing the decision to take one's life. The Tū Ramarama Declaration came out of a conference held, an Indigenous Suicide Prevention Conference held in Te Arawa in 2016. It has three key articles, recognises the anguish and perplexity that frequently accompanies suicide, the impacts of families, friends, as well as whole, the impacts on families, friends, as well as whole communities, i.e. a collective orientation, and says, proclaims that the task is to provide assistance to the victims of suicide so that their modi or spirit can be re rejuvenated and grief or perplexity overcome. Um, there are more... Uh, aspirations and articles, and I'm I'm not sure how I'm going for time. Okay, so I've got five minutes. These PowerPoints will be available, um, and I'm also available if you have any uh, desire to follow up, ask me questions, whatever. I'll be here for 15 minutes taking questions after this um, presentation. The Tūramarama Declaration um, was agreed by 400 people at that conference in Te Arawa. Um, it has since travelled around the world. It has uh, agreement and endorsement from Native American populations, from First Nations people in Canada, in Norway, in Japan, in, um, throughout the Pacific and in um, Aotearoa and in Australia, including the Torres Strait Islands and the Tiwi Islands. So it is widely subscribed to and supported. Um, so that will be available for you to have a look at. And the last thing I want to briefly show you is the National Māori Strategy for Addressing Suicide. Page down. Oh my god. Okay, if we close that one. Yeah, close them all. Yeah. 
I need to open this one up. Can't do that. Okay. We may not be able to show you this, but that's, um, it's okay. It will be available to you. And I'll just talk through the, yeah. Um, and I'll just take the next two minutes to talk through the four key parts of the strategy. <coughs> the overall aims of the strategy are to reduce Māori suicide and suicidal behaviour with focused support for Māori whānau who suffer disproportionately. Rangatahi, Tāne Māori, Takatāpui and other traumatised groups. To support communities to reduce suicide-related suffering, trauma and unresolved grief associated with suicide on whānau, friends and community. And to increase Māori wellbeing and resiliency in mana-enhancing ways. Four goals, and I'll stop after reading these goals to share and implement the Tūramarama Declaration with Māori communities to drive positive change. Two, give effect to iwi, hapu, whānau, hāpuri, Māori and communities for self-determination, including iwi-driven, whānau-centred and collective action to promote well-being. Goal three, identify and manage risks whilst affirming protective factors that safeguard whānau and individuals against suicide, suicidal behaviours and mental distress. And finally, goal four, deliver safe, acceptable and relevant services to whānau and individuals who may be traumatised, distressed or disheartened. So on that note, we'll open for questions. Um, there will be the slides and notes and things will be available, as will the proceedings of the Global Indigenous Suicide Prevention and Research um, Symposium that was held last week at Te Papa. Kia if you've got questions, can you please use the microphone so that the um, online participants can hear? Shall I start? <laughs> yeah. um, kia ora kiri. Thank you very much for that talk. Um, I know that you've been working on some strategies for supporting uh, youth suicide prevention, including yeah. uh, those um, related to hope and building yeah. hope. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, one small project was around, was funded by the University of Otago through a, a research grant was working with uh, five communities where with high Māori suicide uh, rates, for example, Kawaro, Wanganui, Takatāpui or LGBTIQ plus Māori community in Wellington. Um, and Kawaro, did I say Kawaro? Uh, Hawke's Bay or Hastings, Hiritaunga, Two, three, four, is that, anyway, so that was five. So um, the focus or the purpose of the study was on asking young people what hope looked like for them. So it was an examination of the constituents of hope for suicide prevention. And I've referenced the paper on the preliminary findings of that study. Uh, that study was replicated with a a cohort of Lakota youth by um, Professor Jackie Gray, uh, who works at the uh, medical school in uh, North Dakota, University of North Dakota. Um, it's also been picked up recently by uh, Professor Pat Dudgeon in Australia. Um, and the thinking behind that was if we, if we know what hope means and what uh, hope looks like for young, imperiled, at-risk Indigenous youth, then our interventions or our, the support that we give them 
might focus on accentuating those factors. Um, the other study that we've been working on for the past two years um, that's led to the production of a resource on digital storytelling focuses on takatapui or LGBTIQ plus Indigenous youth. And those stories we have gathered in 20 stories from around Aotearoa, which is quite a significant um, feat given that many of them are not out or not willing to share their stories with just anyone. And so, um, so we have their stories, we've been analysing the things that they've been saying uh, about their mental health status, about their attempts to end their lives, about self-harming, about living with anxiety and depression, um, all related to their identity, sexual and gender identities. So that's another study that's never been um, attempted before and that is very revealing for us involved in suicide prevention planning. Hold on. <coughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, as I said, there is a, a reference which you can go to and look at um, the preliminary findings. But the big, big factor was relationships. So it was relationships within Fano, relationships between other. Uh, with other young people, intimate relationships. So that was a, a big issue. Also, the ability to um, have some control over the direction of their lives was another huge issue for them. Um, and then there were a number of uh, sub-issues. Oh, they're not sub-issues because they're equally as important. They just weren't identified in the same strength as the other two. But one of them was around talking about their issues and being able to talk with somebody safe that would hold their issues in trust um, and also access to appropriate, safe, relevant um, support and mental health services. Kia Thanks, Kitty. Um, I was just wanting to ask a question about um, the relationship between the impact of colonisation yeah. and historical trauma yeah. and the kind of the wider kind of macroeconomic changes, and particularly in New Zealand. Yeah. you know, the profound reforms from the 1980s mm. where we pursued, you know, a neoliberal free market yeah. um, economy, the massive yeah. increase in unemployment that disproportionately affected Māori, um, and, you know, the growing inequalities yeah. um, in, across the 1990s. Yeah. How does that interact with this long-term damaging um, impact? Um, it is considered to be a direct outcome of systems and power structures that were set up by the settler colonial government. Um, it is a, for some of our uh, young radical activists who are um, self-confessed socialists, uh, some of them self-confessed communists, it's a direct outcome of systems of capitalism. Um, you know, at the time of colonization, the, I, and I can't remember the name of the politician who said that they needed to, and this was a colonial government, they needed to stamp out the beastly communism of the Māori. Now, we have always our ancestors have always practiced and engaged in uh, collective, um, you know, the, the conditional state of the collective 
was as important, probably possibly more important than the individual state of well-being of tangata or individual people. So in this generation, we're trying to recapture that focus on collectivism in our tribal development processes uh, as a result of the treaty settlement processes, and I'm speaking with my ngaitahu hat on now. But what I have to say about that is that it's all very good in theory, but when it comes to wanting to develop a papakainga or a, a bunch of houses on tribally owned land, then you become acutely aware that the rules are not made for us or by us. So the obstacles to papakainga development include local, um, local authority or local body regulations around uh, sanitation, around um, roadways, around, there is, it's just a myriad of, of, um, of local level legislation that stops us from being able to build on our land and offer some relief to those of our whanau. Māori are four going on 5% more likely to be homeless than any other um, population except for Pacific in this nation, or than the mainstream population, for want of a better way of putting it. So I think, I believe that colonization set in train a whole lot of processes that we are, we are the legacy bearers of in this generation, and our kids are, and our mokopuna are. And so, you know, people say, oh, Kitty, you know, you got the treaty settlement, 150 million whangaitahu. Well, I can tell you hand on heart, that the 1,200 acres that were taken from my whānau, my hapu, in the Akaroa purchase equated, you know, on today's market, according to today's market value, would be worth significantly more. Have I answered your question? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Can you see me online? It's a question from the people at the HPA. They want to know where they can get copies of two research projects you referred to. The HOPE one was Rangatahi and the LGBTIQ and other stories. Yeah. I've, um, I've as I said, I've published on the, um, the findings of the HOPE study, the preliminary findings. It was a small study and a small research grant, but um, we made the most of the money. Um, and that was led by youth for youth, and the University of Otago paid them to do that, to conduct that study and lead that study. The analysis was uh, conducted with youth to youth coordinators. Um, so that's publicly available in a journal called Full Circle, the Journal of Indigenous Research Online. Um, but it's in the notes and the PowerPoints which I can make available. Now, with regard to the um, digital stories of Takatapui youth, some of them will allow those stories to be released publicly, others will not. And that is their right, because uh, it is not my uh, role or my desire to out them, um, if you understand what I mean about that, because the stress of being outed before you're ready to declare who you are is uh, one of the risk factors for suicide. And we know that our takatāpui and LGBTI youth are disproportionately represented in suicide statistics in Aotearoa. So, did that answer your question, Michelle? HPA. 
Michael. Good evening. Thank, thanks very much for that presentation and also your leadership and commitment in looking at these critical issues. I really wanted to ask about one of the opportunities coming up in this area, which is, of course, the mental health review yeah. chaired by Ron Patterson. Yes. Do you see some, do you, are you optimistic about this review? And I guess the other question would be, if you were saying, what would be your top recommendation to this review yourself in terms of uh, addressing these issues? Yeah, kia ora. Um, firstly, the review team were, uh, except for um, Jemima Tia Tia Seath, all of them were present at the symposium last week. Um, and so they were able to uh, expound upon the, the um, what do they call it? It's like the terms of the inquiry, um, the dates and everything. So I made the offer to uh, Ron Patterson to uh, be a conduit or access point to elicit the views and the feedback of Takatapui and other marginalised Māori youth. Um, I believe that, yeah, I believe that the revolution begins at home, and I know some of you get po possibly get tired of me kind of prattling on about that, but it matters what we do in our own backyards. And I also believe that I cannot fully understand the experience of another, but I can empathise and I can in my capacity as a, as a lecturer and as a researcher and as a leader in this field, create space for their voices to be heard. So my advice is that they listen, that they heed the voices of the people. Um, We've seen another national inquiry. We've seen the Mason inquiry, which did produce some value and some uh, benefits, but we didn't get fully what we'd, what we'd asked for. Um, so sometimes as academics and as uh, government employees and um, you know scholars and all the rest of it, we need to quite simply button our lip and open our ears and hear the stories of the people. Because out of that comes the ability to, you know, to comprehend. I mean, I, I have an analysis, other indigenous uh, scholars and researchers have an analysis, but it's not quite the same as speaking to a mother who's lost a child to suicide. So my advice is don't assume you know the answers, don't assume you know the suffering and the level of trauma in our communities. Be open-minded, open-spirited, open-hearted to hearing the stories of people who are suffering. Have I answered your question? Uh, kia ora, kia ora. You kia ora. mentioned um, some of the barriers that could be seen as ongoing colonisation issues, yeah. such as the papakainga yeah. um, struggles. Yeah. I'm interested to know if you see the current government um, yeah. with more optimism in terms of uh, confronting those issues and those barriers and whether you've detected a willingness for those things to be considered in the light of your research. Yeah and some of these solutions that you've identified? Yeah, kia ora whanaunga. I don't hold my breath um, because the government is an, is an outcome of the long history of colonisation. They are limited in what they can do. I believe that they have good intentions, um, but as you know, with Kia Piki Te Oro Te Tai Tamariki, they gave us the indication that they had good intentions but didn't act upon the full and unfettered um, realisation of that strategy. So um, they're constrained. Um, like I said, the revolution begins at home. It's what I do in my own home. It's what I encourage in terms of the behaviour of my children. 
in terms of the behavior of my mokopuna. Um, but there is a groundswell, if you like, of indigenous resistance and indigenous ongoing um, rising up of indigenous protest and it's happening all over the world and it's supported by uh, people like wonderful non-indigenous people like Peace Action Aotearoa, like um, Just, uh, what is it, the Social Justice Movement, what's it called, Just, just Speak. Um, I don't believe in I don't believe in turning away um, the help and support of our colleagues, um, but I do believe in hearing and being careful to hear the voices of our people. Have I answered your question, Arafitu? Kia ora. Uh, any final questions? One, just one up the back. This will be our last one. Thank you very much for your talk. I enjoyed it very much and for your work. Um, I've gone up to East Timor for 20 years and the struggle up there is, is ongoing, but recently there has been some progress uh, in the last week or so, the oil negotiations have gone the way of the Timorese, which was a hell of a fight. Yeah. And the Timorese went to the international court to over that issue. Previously, they had, had a number of advocates around the world who had gone out on limbs. And one of the most amazing things was many years ago when several women uh, broke into a, an army base in Britain or an air force base and, and yeah. destroyed some planes. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about that was those planes were due to be sent to the Indonesian military for bombing, used in bombing raids on the Timorese Island. And under British law, there was a statute which said that if you felt that a piece of equipment was going to be used for genocide, you had the right to destroy it forthwith. Yeah. And it was under that law that the four women, courageous women, were found innocent. John Pilger in his book and in some of his movies has uh, you know, described this incident very well. It was, a, it was a, a monumental case because it allowed activists from around the world to, to tell the story, to tell the truth. My question to you is that um, with the, the access to court in New Zealand, I'm particularly thinking now of the foreshore and seabed, how do you handle that when such a, a piece of well, such an opportunity is denied to you yeah. with your young people um, Helen Clark's decision to to deny access to a court which is you know in a yeah. democracy should be should be one pathway to try and get the story told yeah because people are genuine when they hear the story they reflect and most people say this is bullshit we need to change yeah yeah um with some, I personally react to that with, it really just makes me more bloody minded, I suppose, and more determined to not give up. Um, but I know that it, it depletes the energy, it impacts on the spirits of those young people that I support. And I'll, I'll give you an example of, um, Last night, there was an event behind Te Papa, and that event was to celebrate and have a candlelight memorial service for a young transgender person who committed or ended his, their life in prison after being sentenced to, um, or sentenced, after being placed in solitary confinement, which our current Minister of uh, Corrections, Calvin Davis, says solitary confinement is not practiced in prisons in Aotearoa. Selective segregation is, well, you know, I kind of don't know the difference between those two things. So we can't give up 
because other people rely on those of us who have a voice to exercise that voice on their behalf. And if I go to my grave knowing that I've dedicated my whole life to political activism, to speaking up for those who don't have a voice, like many others in this room and like many others out there in the world and in the community, then maybe I'll pass on, go and be with my tūpuna in a very happy state. The power of people and the power of political activism and the power of the voices of the oppressed should never, ever, ever be underestimated. Thank you very much, Kitty.